Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tara Ramanian, and on behalf of Lung Foundation Australia, I'd like to welcome you to this lived experience panel webinar for lung cancer today. So through this virtual meeting place, we are coming from many parts of Australia. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of country and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. For myself here in Brisbane today, um, I am standing on the lands of the Yagara and Turrbal people. Um, and we pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past, present and emerging. So in honour of World Lung Cancer Day today, we are presenting this webinar and our fantastic panel here today are um, here to answer your questions and to share their lived experiences. Um, but before we begin, just some very brief housekeeping. Um, so firstly, today's webinar will be recorded and made available on our website. So it can be viewed online at a later date if you can't stay for the full duration. And you will be notified by the email that you registered with once the recording is available. Um, secondly, a Q&A session will be held towards the end of the webinar. So please feel free to submit any questions you have in the Q&A box, which you can access in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen throughout the presentation. And please just note that questions should be of a general nature only, uh, and any individual specific questions should be referred to your treating doctor. But without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our fantastic panel today. Uh, we have three amazing speakers from all around Australia. Uh, unfortunately, one of our speakers was unable to make it today due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, so we won't have Georgia with us, but we still have three other lovely panelists. Um, so I'll give a brief run through of who we've got before passing um, on to them to introduce themselves. So our lineup for today is Mel McCann from South Australia, Danielle Kerno from New South Wales, and Cheryl Rowe from Victoria. But uh, before we get started, I'll just hand over to our speakers to introduce themselves so everyone can put a face to the name. Um, and if you could just please share a little bit about yourselves and your journey to give people some context, that would be great. Um, but I'll hand over first to you, Mal, and we'll just follow the order on the slides after you. Hi, folks. Um, Mal from South Australia. We moved over from Victoria about 18, 20 months ago now to be closer to family because of the cancer situation. Um, it's five years last week since we discovered we were on this um, track with the um, with Deborah's health condition with my wife. Um, one of the things that has been a great help for me personally and for us was that I've been a paramedic for 38 years. So I had a fair bit of insight into stuff which helped us plot our pathway through a pretty torturous track. So um, that's where we've come from. and having been caught up in this whole thing, we've, we've got quite strongly involved in advocacy as well. I think that's enough. Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, I'm uh, not quite sure what to say. I was first diagnosed with lung cancer in 2018. It was 1B, um, had a lobectomy like so many other people. Um, pretty much assured it wouldn't come back. 2021, I came back as stage four. So that was May. So it's been about 15 months, I guess. Um, so it's stage four and um, I have the EGFR gene. So I'm on uh, Chiguso, um every day and that's where I'm at. And like Mal, I'm trying to be an advocate as much as possible and just living my life as I can, if I want to. <laughs> I'm Cheryl um, from Victoria. Um, <clears throat> I found out June 2021 that I had breast cancer. It was a great shock at the time. Um, took me a while to um, come to terms with it. I had a lobectomy um, in uh, July 21. And then I needed, because my two cancers that were in that lobectomy were two different cancers, and I had a cancer in my lower left lung, I had to have another biopsy, which showed that this again was a, another different cancer and it had, it had the EGFR gene. So I'm also on Targriso. I've recently had um, a partial lobectomy only two weeks ago. And to their absolute amazement, 
um, the cancer in my lower left lung had actually died and was virtually scar tissue was removed. So at this stage, um, I feel an extremely lucky person. Um, my oncologist wants me to stay on a low dose Targriso, but I will still have bloods every six weeks and CT scans every three months, just to make sure that uh, everything is okay. So yes, I'm pretty happy at the moment. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um with joining us today, guys, and we're really excited to hear of um, your experiences and your learnings, um, and just your journey. So thank you. Um, so we'll kick off today's webinar with our pre-submitted questions sent in via the registration forms. So we'll then go on to any questions um, after that that have been sent to the live Q&A box. Um, but yeah, please do not forget to submit any questions in the live Q&A box throughout the webinar um, and we'll get to them all at the end. So um, we'll start off. And the first question that we had in today um, was, what has been the most helpful thing for you while living with lung cancer? Now we'll start with Cheryl for this one and follow with Danielle. Well, um, my, um, the most, probably the most helpful thing was once I was diagnosed with cancer, my daughter, Karen, who lives in the US, suggested that I look for support groups for lung cancer. And she also referred me to a herbalist who would prescribe complementary therapies to help support, enhance the targeted therapy that my oncologist prescribed. And this made it work more efficiently. Um, I was very unhappy with my first oncologist, and I think it was Nicole from Lung Foundation Australia who suggested I could get a second opinion. One of my cousins who had lung cancer five year, years ago recommended her oncologist. Um, I had had an appointment with him and I've never looked back. He has supported me every step of the way. He's been ahead of everything and I really couldn't thank him enough. Thank you. Can I add to that? I, I For me, um, the most helpful thing I'd say is actually just knowing there's so much research and development going on and there's always trials going on and that um, really helps keep me optimistic and, and, um, and yeah, just optimistic. And cause I, in my head, I know that this is going to become a chronic lung condition rather than a terminal lung condition. And so it's really good for me to see all that term, uh, to see all that research and development going on. The other side of that is I'm not actually seeing the, I'm not re re reading the research. And this has been something that's been really helpful. I have a couple of good friends who read and do all the research and they keep me away from all the negative stuff. So I'm only exposed to all the positive stuff that's coming out. And I think that really, really helps having those people around me who just protect me from all the negativity because, you know, the statistics aren't necessarily great. They're definitely improving, but um, I only see that I really only see the good stuff. Um, and also I think not having to work full time has been really helpful because I can't even imagine having to work full time while dealing with all of this stuff going on. And, you know, as more young people get diagnosed, that's a reality I'm, I'm guessing for a lot of people. I'm so glad I don't have to do that. Amazing. Thank you, ladies. Um, so we'll go on to our next question. So the next one we got in was, how do you look after your mental health while living with lung cancer? Um, now, Danielle, we'll start us off with this one. Um, but Cheryl or Mel, if you have anything to add on following that, please feel free to jump in. Um, I'll just warn you, my dogs are probably about to bark for someone coming in. Um, I do have some notes here, so just bear with me. But um, first thing I've got to say is, I think the mental game of cancer is so underestimated by treating doctors and people in the field. I think, you know, for me, I always say this to people, I can't control the treatments. I'm not a researcher, I'm not a developer, I'm not an oncologist. I can't control any of that, but I can do things to control my mental health. So for me, that is, you know, it cannot be underestimated how important it is to deal with the mental health stuff. And I really wish that um, treating practitioners would put more emphasis on that than they actually do. Um, but the first thing, and I just alluded to this in the other question, um, how much I read about it, I found is really important for my mental health. 
I know a lot of people do a lot of research on their own, but like I said, I have a couple of people who do all my research for me and don't tell me anything unless it's positive and, and important for me to know. And I find that's really helpful because I'm not constantly being exposed to bad outcomes and bad statistics. Um, and I think speaking when I talk to people about it, I talk in a very matter of fact way. I think that helps my mental health because I don't get the pity eyes. You know, I'm sure you all know pity eyes. Oh, you poor thing. That's so terrible. Oh, it's like, well, mate, <laughs> I know it's terrible. I don't need you to tell me. So I just, when I tell people, I'm very matter of fact about it. Um, and, um, and talking to people from the lung cancer community, that's been so important. I really feel I'm part of a new community. And that's actually been one of the good things about having lung cancer um, is that I have this great community now that I'm developing and feel like I'm becoming part of. And we all have the same experience. Well, we all have different experiences, but we all have the experience of being told you have lung cancer. And I think being able to talk to people who've been through that, and it just makes a difference being talked to, you know, people who haven't been through that. On a more practical level, I try to meditate, exercise. I am try to be careful what I eat. And I see a counsellor when I need to. Um, and I find they all really help my mental health. Um, I've been working a lot lately and not taking such good care of my mental health. And like I haven't been meditating or exercising as much lately. And I can really feel the impact on of that on my mental health now. I'm quite down at the moment. And, um, and I think it's just because I'm not doing that meditating, that exercising and just eating well and just doing all those things, you know, are important to keep us alive as long as possible. Get my thoughts on how I look after it. <laughs> um, I suppose to jump in from two sides here. Um, because carers, carers are on a journey that is significantly different to those who are dealing one on one with the cancer, as it were. <clears throat> and so it's a it's a um, a double blade that you've got to work. I Deborah and I are both um, bugged into clean sites when we've needed, which has been great. Um, one of the most important things I think we did was that. Um, it really helped us focus on our relationship on what was actually important. And so I, I sort of made a, a thing, a decision very early in the piece, but whatever Deb wanted, if Deb asked for something, I'd say sure. And we'd just do it. It didn't matter how. Sometimes it seemed a bit weird, but we did it anyway. And um, and I found that that just, my, my desire was to take the pressure out of Deb having to try and debate some things through to if it was the right thing or a wrong thing. So I just said, whatever you want. And <clears throat> that's been really helpful, I think. I mean, sometimes Deb will go, oh, I don't think we need that now. Yeah, that's okay. That's sure. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. Well, we won't do that. Um, the other thing is <clears throat> um, we try to walk as much as we can or um, you know, go for drives, whatever. And if Deb wants to talk, um, I just let her talk and talk and talk. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's specific and sometimes it's just, Look at the colour of the butterflies. I don't care. The more that that uh, get dead can vent, um, the better it is. And anyone who's gone through the mill knows the story of Scanxiety. Um, as you're running into your next set of um, CTs and bloods and that, and it it doesn't get better over time. We found it. You, the Scanxiety is there, and I know that in those weeks, you're just going to have to plug in more. You know, might be a case coming. We need to go for a drive just because I know she'll start talking beside me. And, that, and similarly, I, I will say, so there are times when I just need to vent too. So I think talking is really important. Um, all the things that uh, Cheryl and um, both the girls said, um, yeah. hang on, sorry. And um, all those things, all important, but from a carer side of the world too, I think it's really important to find a trusted person that you can, um, that you can vent to. Not always easy, but um, again, Lung Foundation has been good with that because when we've plugged into things, there's always someone I can talk to there. Probably said enough. Mel, Mel, can I just say, I think the carer is often um, overlooked to a certain extent, it seems to me, all the attention is given <clears> to the person with lung cancer, but the way you're dealing with like Deb plus and her emotions, plus your own emotions. And I think that really needs to be acknowledged that, um, oh. You, you, are, you know, the carers are really dealing with a lot and it's really important that their mental health is looked after as well. 
think that really needs to be acknowledged. Yeah, I think you're right, Danielle. It's, and I, I'm not trying to, to go for the pity eyes here either, but it, the carer's road is, is a different road. It's a parallel highway, but it's a different road. And there are things where a patient, a patient, you know, a person going through the process, I know Deb will not tell me some things, which drives me a little bit crazy, but also I know there are heaps of things I just can't tell her about what I'm feeling at present. Um, there are sometimes you've just got to pick your moment and sometimes you just don't say anything. You know, and if it's so something she's doing is doing your head in, you know what, just take a big breath. But it's a different journey and um, that's why the, the lung foundation peer system and things like that are really important for carers, I think. Yeah, I know that um, the person who, or the people, I've got two people who do all my research for me, I know they're carrying a lot of things that I'm not carrying because they know <clears throat> they've seen the bad stuff I'm not seeing. And I'm, you know, I have, I have to be careful about that as well, um, about getting them to do to find these things out. So yeah, as you said, there's things you can't tell her. Yeah. Um, I, with this question, um, I think it really starts right at the beginning of your diagnosis. I, I, I was in complete shock. Um, I kept thinking, oh, look, you know, they must have read somebody else's report and they've made a big mistake. So it, it is a huge um, mental health problem, uh, probably right through, but for me it was the initial um, first three, four months. Um, and when it finally hit home that I definitely had lung cancer, yes, it, it is depressing for quite a while. Um, as time went on, I accepted that I did indeed have uh, lung cancer and I set out to find out as much information as I, I could so that I was really informed. Um, I calmed myself down. Um, as you can't think and properly or make you know, right decisions for your health when you're in such an agitated, panicked state. Um, my philosophy was to keep calm. I believe that this is the best state to be in, to be of the, the most benefit to you. Um, people would say to me, friends, family, you've got to fight this thing. But as soon as you think about that, your whole body tenses up and it doesn't help you at all. So for me, it's keeping as calm as I can, being as informed as I can and, and being in control also of the decisions that the oncologists are making for me uh, so that I'm, I'm involved. Um, and yes, I'm, I just find I'm so much better by keeping myself calm. A um, bit of med uh, meditation, um, as Danielle said, walking my dogs, um, being with my dogs is huge for me because I don't have family living next near well nearby um but um yeah keeping calm thank you just sorry just back to what cheryl was saying i think this whole thing of you've got to be positive all the time and that's a lot of pressure to put on someone <laughs> like you, of course you know like because then there's negative thoughts of course i have negative thoughts and i assume everyone has negative thoughts you know we're living with lung cancer how can you not but then because you're always told you've got to be positive because that affects your outcomes, and then you feel guilty for feeling down sometimes. So I think it's really important to give yourself permission to um, to feel negative at times, to feel to have those moments where you are depressed and you're going, oh, my God, you know, this is so hard, or to have those moments, even if, you know, I, I think obviously there's a difference between that and depression, but don't feel bad when you do have those moments of grief because the grief really is real. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's real. I've got a 20 year old and a 17 year old and um, the grief is real, you know? So you've got to give yourself moments to have those, but you can't dwell on that. I think if you are dwelling that in that all the time, then you need to really seek professional help. And I think that's, that's a difference between being depressed and letting yourself be honest with your emotions inside. That was really inspiring to hear your personal experience and what has helped you guys. Um, and looking up your mental well-being is often something quite overlooked as well. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll go on to our next question. 
Um, this one is a bit more care specific, but um, you can also hear the patient's perspective as well. So we'll start with Mel to answer this one. How do you help support someone who is living with lung cancer? Um, and after Mel, maybe I think Cheryl had also um, something to add on, but Danielle, if you have anything, also jump in. I'll start off with you, Mel. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this one's a bit of a how long's a piece of string story, to be honest. Um, to paint a bit of a picture that, that I sort of verbalised very early in our experience of, of what the whole thing's like, if you can imagine Top Gun, the movie's just coming in, so it helps. You're flying along in a fighter jet at night, going at, you know, high speed through the darkness, and suddenly all the lights on your dashboard come on, master warning comes up, it says eject, eject, eject. You punch out, 30 seconds later, you splash into the ocean. You don't know where land is, you don't know what happened. You've got total chaos raining all around you, and that's what you land in with this, with, with this situation, with this diagnosis, it was our experience. And so we didn't know where anything was. And, and while I've landed in the ocean, dead planted right beside me, and we're in exactly the same boat. So the important thing to me was to just stay close um, and realise that sometimes staying close meant getting your mouth shut and um, being at arm's length. Um, I probably touched on this a bit on the previous question, but... It was just, it's just been really important to know that um, as a carer, it, it, there's going to be days where nothing makes sense and, and you, um, you've just got to roll with the punches. And it, it might sound really, really dumb thing to say, but in many, many ways, Deb getting, being diagnosed with, with stage four um, has done a phenomenal amount of, of beneficial things for our relationship. A lot of the rubbish, you know, um, dissipated, you know, and you know, sulking because you didn't get your own way. Well, there ain't time for that, you know. So we, so we, we found that there was, you know, forgive quickly, and that was really important. Which we probably should have been doing a lot earlier in our marriage than, than having to get something like this happen. But it was really important that if, from my perspective, was that you know what, if Deb's having a bad hair day and she bites her head off or something just because she's stressed or not feeling well and all that, you know what, big deal, get on with it. Um, it's, it's just a, a matter of always being, from my personal experiences, how can, how can I adjust things to, uh, to support her at this point? And that might be a time saying we can't come at short notice to something. Um, sometimes it's being the fall guy and, and being prepared to be, be the fall guy for things. Um, so sometimes it's, it's protecting her. Um, certainly within the system, within the medical system, having a medical background was really helpful in that I could, I would keep asking questions until I could look at Deb and know that she actually knew all the answers. And if she didn't know all the answers, I knew I could translate it for her when we got home. And that was really important to be that advocate. And I, I don't think Deb's been to the oncologist in the early stage, the first few years of the, of the whole game. I don't think Deb went to the oncologist on her own at any time. If I couldn't go, I had a trusted friend who would go. And the idea was we ask questions and you're, you're just going to have to keep answering this question until we understand it and break it down into bits. So that was really important so that the blur of, the, of a doctor's appointment, when it dissipates and they go, what did they mean by pink socks, you know, well, you can go, oh, well, the pink socks was this story. So that was a really important thing to do. And I always tried to make sure that, you know, in the vast majority of times we were there. Um, Realising that scans eye is a very real part of this game, that you're both having it, but as a carer, your scans eye is secondary. And so you, you're there to, to um, help calm the waves in front of them if you possibly can. Um, and Sometimes you just have to be a, a bit harsh with people, I guess, because, you know, this is the, as Deborah describes lung cancer, this is the you deserve it cancer um, in a lot of mental processes in people's mind. Oh, lung cancer. Oh, and the first question, you must have smoked. Even doctors say that, which bugs me something fierce. Um, and so sometimes you, you actually have to go in um, swinging the scythe, as it were, to cut down those myths on behalf of the... Um, 
on, be, on behalf of Deb in our situation. Um, some other comments might trigger other things, but that's probably enough at this point, throw it to the girls. Can I just add to that, um, Mel? For me, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm still pretty active and I can still do most things for myself, but I had someone come in very early on and they just took over all my life admin stuff. Like I just bought all my bills and, you know, anything that comes in, I just fall straight to them. They've got access to my account. They pay all my bills for me. They come up and stay with me for three weeks then go home for three weeks to the, where they live. And um, while they're here, they cook meals and clean my place. And that I, I just so appreciate that because it gives me space just to do what I need to do to focus on myself. And I think just that, that those really practical stuff, of course, the, the other stuff, the emotional support as well, but that practical stuff has been so helpful to me. It's just given me space to, to do what I need to do to look after myself and focus on myself and take that stress of life admin off me. And that's really helpful as well. I'd, I'd agree with that, Danielle. I'd, I'd look after that stuff. And um, one of the important things, my wife just walked past the window and made a face at me. Um, one of the important things, um, I think, from a carer is realising that uh, Deb's on targeted therapy now and foggy brain is just par for the course. And, and so taking that stuff off them is, is not saying you're incompetent or anything, but it's, it's helping them acknowledge that, you know what, I'm having a, a brain fog day today. I can't think straight. And that's okay. And so me doing those admin things, um, certainly it's not what you've said, Danielle, it just takes that pressure off. You don't have to make worry where you've made a bad decision because I'll look after that for you. Uh, Cheryl, again, I'm coming at, at this question from a, a different angle. Um, I'm coming at from the side of um, me helping other cancer sufferers, not me, um, uh, and, and I have cancer. So it's sort of from a different perspective than me being the, the person only, um, being a carer for um, a person in my household that has uh, lung cancer. Um, I've, my main way of helping people is to tell as many people in my various groups about all the helpful organisations like Lung F Foundation Australia, Peter Mac, websites, uh, Facebook, etc. Because I have the EGFR gene, there is an EGFR group and, and they're just so helpful. Um, Encourage them to stay relaxed. Medication, uh, sorry, meditation. Um, anything that stops them focusing on, I've got cancer, I'm going to die, panic. Um, I, as I said before, I don't believe in this, um, I have to fight cancer. I find it very counterproductive and um, it just brings more tension into the body. Um, encourage them to, to eat well um, and exercise um, and um, also when, when we get on to these, some of these self-help groups or Zoom meetings, if, if you can answer one of their questions that you have already been through, again, it is such a, a help to, to other people. Um, and the other thing is that um, a lot of people are wondering, you know, how did I get cancer? I'm, I'm in my 30s or 40s. I've never smoked in my life. And this apparently is showing up more and more in young women that have never smoked. And there definitely needs to be more re research in this, this area. Um, getting slightly off the cancer one, I read recently that... Um, a lot of people, young people now, and particularly young women again, are getting pancreatic cancer, and they have no idea why. All these things need to be far more researched. The government needs to put more money into research for all these areas. Thank you. Can I, sorry, can I just go off on a tangent as well? Uh, sorry, not as well. Can I go off on a tangent? Um, just back to something Mel said about the brain fog. I always say to people, I feel like I have like between a half, no, sorry, not half, a quarter and a third of my brain is always offline. 
these days because it's even when I'm not actively thinking about the cancer it's like my brain is part of my brain is always engaged with it so I feel like I've lost a quarter to a third of my brain power to just to do day-to-day things and I think it's just your brain is anxious about it or it's thinking about it somewhere in the subconscious so my brain is not as good as it was and and I think that's just why it's just that preoccupation with cancer so I'm glad you raised that Mel. Yeah and it's it's really important from a carer's perspective I think and I'm only giving one opinion but it is to acknowledge the brain fog and actually I mean Deb, Deb will say to me I'm having a bit of a brain fog day to day and I went yeah mate <laughs> and it's okay we can laugh about it because she just some days like you say Danielle sometimes a, a portion of her brain's out to lunch um, and it's particularly I've noticed it, it it ramps up in that last week before scans again so scans are ideas you know it's a very real part of the game um, but yeah it, it does happen and it's important for those supporting people and those who are dealing with it to realize it's just part of the game and don't beat yourself up over it you just got brain, brain fog Amazing. Thank you. That was really insightful um, to hear all of your experiences and thoughts. So thank you for sharing. Um, So we'll just move on um, to the next question. So we've got two more questions before we go to the live Q&A portion. So please submit any questions you have. Um, The Q&A box, again, is in the toolbar. Um, So please feel free to um, submit them through. Um, so our next question is, what support do you find most helpful from health professionals? Um, now, I believe Cheryl, um, you'll start us off with this one and followed by Danielle. Um, but Mal, if you have anything to add on as well, feel free to jump on. Well, I, I've found um, quite a few um, health pro- professionals have been um, excellent for my, um, my mental health for, for everything starting off with my, my local doctor. Um, she, she has just been great. Um, as I said before, my first oncologist was not very helpful, uh, didn't discuss any treatments or options with me, just said, this is what we are going to do, and that was that. Um, I didn't realise at the time I was entitled to more information to make a knowledgeable, knowledgeable uh, decision on my health. In early diagnosis, you are in a dreadful panic state and all you you just want to do is go along and, um, you know, get help as quickly as possible. You you think, well, they know everything, they're going to do everything right, but it doesn't always turn out that way. Uh, My second oncologist, just lovely, uh, explains everything to me, discusses every part of my treatment so that I understand. The Lung Foundation have been absolutely marvellous. Nicole, um, Leilani, uh, Tara, Paxton, given me so much information and support, whether it's been products to use on my poor, sore, dry skin, uh, toothpaste that, uh, because the targeted therapy made my mouth so sensitive, um, information about palliative care, exercise programs, The list goes on and on. Um, I also do Zoom meetings through Lung Foundation, all so helpful. Um, I do Zoom meetings with Peter Mack um, once a month. Uh, Makes it so much easier talking to other people going through the same lung cancer. Uh, This is a great way of getting helpful information. Some months they have professional people giving talks, example, dietitians, psychologist, skin specialist, um, et cetera. Um, I think it would be very good for doctors and oncologists to have a list of these organisations to pass on to newly diagnosed people. Um, They make you, these organisations make you feel um, not so alone um, on this this journey of life. I'm just going along with what Cheryl said, I think it's really important that you have a, a group of health professionals that you trust. And, you know, you can decide for yourself who you want in that group. Um, I would suggest a GP and oncologist, um, lung cancer nurse and a counsellor being there somewhere. But, you know, some people like to have a naturopath, um, I've got naturopaths on and off, or, you know, meditation leader, whatever you decide. But whoever you have in that group of health professionals, they've got to be people you can trust, I think. 
and feel comfortable with. Um, like Cheryl, I've had problems with an oncologist. Um, I have two oncologists and um, I have two oncologists now and I, I feel like it's really important to have the, a group that you can trust. So I'll stop saying that. <laughs> but what I find most important from them is time. I think um, they really just need to give you the time to listen to what you're saying and what you're asking and to answer the questions in full. And um, I find not all health professionals want to do that. They have their agenda and they're not open to um, going down a path they don't want to go down or answering questions that um, they don't feel need to be need to be answered at this time, you know, because, you know, I've been told I'm on the degree, so I'm on, I'm on the best treatment. I don't need to worry about anything else. Well, you know what, you're telling me that is not going to make me not worry about it. So let's just pretend that degree, so is not working or whatever, and let's just go down that path because, you know, this is something that could happen. So, um, but I've, yeah, so I, I think just time listening and answering your questions and it just doesn't always happen, unfortunately. And it's it's um so important, I think. And, and yeah, giving you the direct information that you need to know. I, I'm going to reflect on the, on the, the face of people that we've dealt with. Um, the standout, <clears throat> Stand out one to me that's really important is, is honesty. And like, like a benchmark, if, if your specialist is going to sit on the end of your bed and talk to you, that's a really strong indicator they're plugged into you. Um, and when Deb had to have her lobectomy, the surgeon um, that we dealt with was just, just magnificent. No other way to describe it, magnificent man. Um, and he... Um, he went the extra mile and every time we saw him it was the same thing it wasn't just there wasn't just a patient she, he was really part of her thing and like we were up to speed on how his kids were going at school and things like that and that was really important but he was also very honest he, he just tell you this is how it is um and the frustrating one is where you there's potential for it to be for people to gloss you over and um and and not want to give you all the answers because they're under a time pressure. But um, again, the ones who are prepared to just keep going until you understand it, that's really, really important. Um, and I'd say that's that's universal across the thing. If they're prepared to do it and do it until you understand. And the best, the benchmark, I guess I'd say, is when Deb had to have chemo, the nursing team in the chemo ward at South Eastern Private in Melbourne um, at a southeastern hospital in yeah, Melbourne, where Clayton, where it is, they were the absolute standout of what, what a healthcare professional that does everything was about. They would explain it to the nth detail in really simple terms. And that was, to me, a really good benchmark. Amazing. Thank you, guys. Um, so we are on to our last question for the pre-submitted um, portion. Um, so please do continue to submit any um, questions in the live Q&A box. Um, so the last one we have in is, how do you help your family and friends to understand your condition? Um, now, Danielle, I'll hand over to you to start us off and followed by Mel um, and Cheryl, of course, as always, jump in if you have anything else to add on. I'm going to say, I actually found this a really difficult question because um, I'm not quite sure what is meant by getting to understand. Um, but when I tell people, I guess, um, family, and also what level of friends and family, there's, you know, of course, two different levels, several different levels. But um, I find when I tell people, I find it really helpful for me to just say it in a matter-of-fact way. Um, because if I say it matter-of-fact, they follow my lead and it's just a thing. It's not like a terrible, sad, oh, let's fall down in tears thing. It's just a... I have lung cancer, I'm living with lung cancer, you know, um, as a matter of fact, part of everyday life. And that's, they follow my lead. And so I think I said before about the, the pity voice and the pity eyes, I try to avoid them as much as I can because they're not great for my mental health, seeing them reflected back at me. So so if, if I just say to someone, I'm living with lung cancer or I have lung cancer, move on, you know, how was your day sort of thing. I find that's the best way to, to address that. Um, and then if they if they come back at me, and I have some people who seem to insist on doing the pity stuff, but if they come back at me with that, you know, when I've told them, I usually just say, yeah, it sucks, but that's the way it is, and then move on. You know, I don't dwell on the negative part of it. Um, 
I think I tend to give people an explanation of the fact that there are different types of lung cancers and my type of lung cancer as well. Um, and I always, like Mal said before, people, first thing people say, I didn't know you smoked or, oh, you're a smoker, were you? It's like, piss off with that question. How many times, you know, like, seriously? People, and then, you know, if you, I actually have called people out on that. And they say, oh, but I'm not judging you. But you know what? You are judging me. Just the fact that you are asking that question means there's a judgment around it. Because if there was no judgment around it, it wouldn't matter if I smoked or not. So why why do you need to know or why do you make need to make that comment? And um so so I always I always try to put that in somewhere so that people know it's not a lung, it's not a, a smoker's disease, as I think the Lung Foundation says, or, and I've heard various people say, if you've got a pair of lungs, you get you can get lung cancer. And I always try to throw that in somewhere as well when I tell people. Um, so that they know that. Um, so I also, when I tell people, I, I talk to them about the new research that's going on again, so that they get a greater understanding that it's not, you know, um, how it used to be. It's it's a I, I see lung cancer is quite different now to how it was five, 10 years ago. And I want people to realize that. So I always put that in as well in an answer. Uh, and when I sorry, when I tell someone. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know it's not a life sentence like it used to be. It's it's so not anymore. Um, I also don't go into great detail when I talk with people because I think most people, from what I just said, it sounds like I do go into a lot of, lot of detail, but I actually don't. Because um, most people don't, they don't want to know detail. You know, they just want to know, are you okay? Are you not okay? And how can I have the support if you need it? You know, they just want to show their love for you. Um, and they don't need to know all the details and the new shot of what's, what's going on around it. That's for me and the people closest to me. Now, with that, it's a really tricky thing for the people who are closest to you, what to share and what not to share, I find, because um, I want to protect my kids, I want to protect my mum, you know, I want to protect those people from it as, as much as I can. Um, but at the same time, if I try to protect them too much, they feel like they've been shut out. So it's getting that balance of what to share and what not to share. Um, I now, if I've got a scare, if I've got an appointment coming up, I will now tell my mum because I know she worries, and then I'll just tell her just a brief, yeah, it was fine or something. Um, and my kids, you know, I still haven't found that answer <laughs> of how they understand I've got lung cancer, of course. But you know, how do you talk to them about life in the future when when you don't know? You know, the, the world of lung cancer is changing so rapidly. Um, so I don't want to be talking to them about death and you know them having a life without their mother when I'm expecting to live for 15 years. So I I haven't got the answer to how to get them to under, I guess how to talk to them, not so much understand it, but how to keep that conversation going, have that um how, how to get that balance. It's it's it is a balancing act, how to just um, talk to people, especially the people closest to you. People a bit further out, it's easier because you can do all, what I just said before, but the people closest to you, how do you protect them but at the same time give them the information they need? It's, it's, it's a real balancing act for me. Mel or Cheryl, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Sorry, Cheryl? Uh, sorry, yes, I can. Um, I, I found this uh, extremely difficult. Um, I, my family uh, and friends, they just don't understand what you're going through. They really don't. Um, and at one stage early on, um, one of my daughters said to me, you're giving up. I said, no, I'm not giving up. I'm just going through the process of finding out everything, coming to terms with what I'm going through. And um, once I said that to them, they realised that that's what I needed to do. I was going through a stage of grieving possibly what I would miss out on in life, um, that kind of thing. Once I got past it, they could see how relaxed I was and they became more relaxed about it. Um, they also go into a panic when you get this kind of diagnosis. I mean, it's only only natural. Um, and and I... I do encourage them to, um, if they want to, uh, to find out about the particular kind of cancer I have, um, go to appointments so that they get better knowledge. 
um, and you know what the process is going to be. Um, and some people just don't want to know your particular kind of cancer. They bury their heads in, in the sand and just say, oh, you'll be all right, mate. Yeah, everything's fine. Oh, you'll beat it, this kind of thing. Um, because they don't, they don't want to get into a conversation and discuss it with you. Um, I, I find that if I have confidence talking to my friends and family um, and, you know, some, some people say to me uh, when I say I've got lung cancer, they go, oh, and then I tell them that there are different kinds of lung cancer and the kind that I've got is the kind that you get when you don't smoke. Oh, I didn't know there are different kinds of lung cancer. So to me, their attitude was changing, not saying, oh, well, you, you smoked, so therefore you deserve to, you know, get this, you know, to get lung cancer. So I find that I do that quite often to make people more aware of um, various kinds of cancers and that not all are just related to smoking, whether it's lung cancer or anything else that um, smokers are apparently prone to, to getting. So, you know, that's, that's sort of the way I handle it, but it is a difficult situation, I do agree. Thank you. I think just adding to that thing about smoking, and this is something that I talk ad nauseum about really, I think regardless of whether or not you're a smoker, um, you don't deserve to die, right? So I think I don't, I, I talk about the fact that there are these cancers that lung cancers that come from not smoking, but I always add in, in even if I did smoke, would I deserve to die because of that? You know, it's, it's drug tobacco companies, they, you know, they're selling us a product they want us to become addicted to. So if you become addicted to that, you haven't done, you've just, you haven't done anything wrong. Like you've just bought, I don't want to say fallen for something, but you've done what the tobacco companies advertising designed their advertisements for you to do. Do you know what I mean? Like we all make mistakes and you don't deserve to die just because you made the mistake of becoming addicted to smoking. And, you know, I've worked with addicts in my professional life and they all say smoking is the hardest thing to give up. So, you know what, and you don't half treat someone just because they made a mistake of picking up a cigarette when they were 14 or whatever and become addicted to it. And I think we need to push the fact that, A, not all, you know, 30% of, almost 30% of lung cancers are not from smoking. But even if you did get a lung cancer from smoking, you don't deserve to die from it. And you don't deserve to be judged for it. I think we need to push both of those. I, I agree with everything Danielle has just said. Um, it's, uh, I, the stigma for lung cancer is just so much compared to if people um, get liver cancer from, or what do you call it, from drinking too much. Um, you know, there's not that stigma for those people that there is for people with lung cancer. And I just can't see the difference if you drink yourself to death or you smoke yourself to death or whatever. There should not be that stigma. Um, as Danielle said, we all make mistakes in our lives. Um, if we'd known X amount of years ago that um, if you, you smoked, you'd get cancer, you'd die, uh, well, you know, nobody would, would have smoked, or hopefully not. Um, so um, it's the same with alcohol. I mean, that's been encouraged so much over the years that uh, you, you don't turn around and say, oh, well, you've, you've been drinking all those years, well, you deserve to get liver cancer or whatever. That's, I just hate this stigma with lung cancer. It's just not fair. Well, we don't say to people with brain cancer, oh, if only you'd, thought of, if only you'd use your brain more, you wouldn't have brain cancer. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, or people with breast cancer. If only if you breastfed your child, you wouldn't have breast cancer. You know, whatever. We don't do that. Smoking is one of the very few where we have such a strong moral judgment around it, and it sucks so hard. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I, I've I've turned into a real defender of people who smoke, <clears throat> um, because I I feel really defensive of of that very question. Oh well, did you smoke? But but. Deborah would cough all the time. I'm going exactly what the girls have said, but this is this is can no one no one like goes out and says, oh, I think I'll go and get cancer today. It's um <laughs> it's something that happens. And 
it, irrelevant of where it came from. The thing is a person is in a condition that where there is a need for understanding and support. And um, going back about two years ago, LFA were running a, a, a thing about kill the stigma. And we still have a long way to go there. But I find myself increasingly jumping in going, just because a person smoked doesn't mean they have any deserving of this um, or anything else. The other thing that um, I, from a professional life and that, that I, I've considered that the Western, our Western world deals really badly with death. We call it a million things and never call it death. And death, dead and dying are really important healing words, which we avoid like the plague. So I always try to talk about when we're trying to help family and friends who understand that, you know, the, the, um, no one gets out alive to start with, but, but the death, death is, is increasingly likely um, with, with illnesses and particularly with, with um, lung cancer. And while we're making some roads in research, um, living with the fact that death death's part of the, part of the, the profile, I think it's important to acknowledge that because as, as Cheryl said, people with the fob of, oh, you'll beat this. And well, actually, yes, I hope we do. But the odds, you know, are pretty steep in places. Um, and to acknowledge that the death's part of it. Now, Deb and I have a strong Christian faith. The death thing's not a big deal to us. But um, it's been really important for us to say that to people too, that, you know, this is, this is no biggie in, in that sense. Certainly, I don't want Deb to die early and we don't want our grandkids to be deprived of nanotime. And that's why we moved across the country to increase our nanotime with, with Deb while she can. Um, but I think it's important to um, answer questions and encourage family and friends to not be afraid to ask the questions. And our, our son, um, a beautiful young bloke, and he, you know, early on he'd go, oh, you could see him wanting to ask a question and not going to and his, and his wife. And we've sort of got to the point now of, just ask the question. You know, if we can answer it, we're going to answer it for you. Um, and so that that important aspect of, of helping family and friends to understand is, is that talking about the realities of the game. Um, but I also bang on a bit about, I figure every person that understands information better is another advocate in the year of a politician somewhere. And so I tend to hit them with stats a fair bit too to say, here's some data on this. Um, and realise that as soon as if there's someone close to you and their family or or um, friends and while some of them might fob you off with oh you'll be right there are also some that are now become part of the they've been caught in the ejection out of the jet at night trip that they're now being devastated by the news as well and so then then the other part of you swings in and that is the peer support of your family and your friends and and even the person dealing with the cancer becomes a peer supporter and, a, and a, um, a counselor for those members of their family that are just trying to learn to cope with it at the same time. Amazing, thank you. You guys shed some light on some really important points there. So thank you again for sharing. Um, but yes, yeah, so that does actually bring us to the end of our pre-submitted question portion. Now, just being mindful of time, we might only get time for one, maybe two of the live Q&A. Um, so I'll just start with the one. Um, how have you managed your lung cancer during COVID and did it affect your access to your healthcare team? Now, the floor is open, so any panellists is free to start off? I'll, I'll start with this one because I just had COVID four weeks ago. Um, and I'll try to answer that first question as well, just quickly as well, because um, I think that's a good question and it's where I'm at as well. Um, uh, it really affected my um, healthcare team. <laughs> my Well, not my access. I went straight on to Paxlovid, which I think most people do, the antivirals. Um, unfortunately, um, it's caused a bit of conflict with my um, oncologist. I did cause some conflict with one of my oncologists. Um, and this is where it goes back to time and giving you answers that you need. Um, they failed, I feel, I feel that they failed to answer the question of why I need to go off my Tegriso. So I continued on my Tegriso and they did not like the fact that I did. Now I've since spoken to another oncologist who has said to me, give me the reason. I went, oh, okay, if I'd known that, I would have liked the Tegriso. Um, so, um, but it really hasn't affected me in any other way. Um, I've got to say, I wasn't as careful as I should have been about getting it. Um, uh, and uh, it's just, it's had an, an impact just on my interactions with my oncologist is really 
that was mostly impacted me. For this other one, I totally get this, um, the trying to be normal because I look normal. There's no way you'd know I had um, cancer. Um, and you know what? I, I just take time out when I need it and I've stopped feeling guilty. Um, I, you know, I worked, as I said, I worked a whole lot just recently and it's exhausted me and I'm now taking time off. I work casually. I won't pick up any work for three weeks to a month because I, I can't carry on as normal. And um, and I'm, I just tell people I'm, I do get to pick time more easily and emotionally I'm not where I was either. So um, I tell people and I just have lost the guilt of not being able to do everything I could do before. And if people don't like it, that's on them. I, I, their responses are their responses. I. I've lost the guilt. Danielle, did you say that you should have gone off Targriso when you uh, are? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not that I've had COVID, but I'll keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Your, your oncologist should tell, should tell you and should tell you why. Mm. Um, I, I found I was diagnosed in, as I said, um, 2021 in the middle of one of our big lockdowns. And I did feel I did not get um, the help from my oncologist or my thoracic surgeon, as I think I should have. I um, didn't get all the information that I, I needed. Um, so whether that was to do with the lockdown or whether it, the people I was dealing with, I, I really don't know. COVID sort of really made us fairly gun shy, I, I suppose, of crowds and that. Um, we've always been strong wearers of masks. Even when when we moved out to South Australia, we're looking at each other, coming from where Cheryl is, coming through the lockdowns in Victoria, and then coming over here and now I'm wearing a mask, we're going, what? Mm -hmm. um, but we um, are quite careful um, about um, getting in too big a closed, in, uh, large crowds in, pop, in uh, dense areas. Um, early on in the piece, our oncologist over, over East said, oh, well, Deb, if you get COVID, because we didn't know much about COVID at stage, I suppose, if you get COVID, it'll probably kill you. And <laughs> so we were, we were really, right, right, this is fairly serious stuff, this. Um, and we've been blessed so far that we haven't, neither of us have had COVID, therefore Deb hasn't been at a high risk of that. Um, even though our kids have in recent times, and they live 50 metres away, so we've dodged that one. But it, it certainly had as amped up a degree of concern. Um, the up jump was that um, where we lived in Victoria, our oncologist was now 40 away. So every time we had to go, it was um, it was a whole day. Yeah, we we an hour 40 up to set the oncologist, hour 40 home and that. Um, and so when COVID came in, they could do phone consult. And that really, there was an upside to COVID because we didn't have to do all that traveling. We could do a lot more of it on, on consult. So there was an upside. So I should add, I did say earlier, I wasn't as careful as I should have been, as I could have been. I was really careful when it was Delta and the, the really bad ones. It was only since Omicron sort of became more prevalent, I stopped being quite so careful. I still wore masks and I didn't go into many crowded groups, but I would go out more often. And, and I've gone back to being really careful again because it's, you know, surged again. So, yeah, I just want to clarify that I was really careful when it seemed like it was a lot worse. I know you would have been Dan. Great, thank you guys. Um, so unfortunately that is all we have time for. It is one o'clock. Um, that hour did go too fast, but um, this was a really, really inspiring space. But thank you to all three of you, Mal, Cheryl and Danielle, um, for everything that you shared with us today. Um, so on behalf of Lung Foundation Australia as well, thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, it has been a pleasure to have you with us and to our panellists. Um, I'm sure all of us are really inspired and have learned a lot. Um, and I've gotten some really practical recommendations as well. So um, to also just follow up, um, if anyone wanted to connect in with any of our services, we do have um, some really great lung cancer support services that have been mentioned um, throughout this webinar as well. So we do have the Lung Cancer Support Nurse Service, which helps provide evidence-based information and guidance um, around any aspects of cancer care. And also a Lung Cancer Social Worker Service, which helps to address more so the emotional, social and physical support needs um, to people affected by lung cancer, as well as their carers. So 
Both of these services are available to patients and carers and they're all free and confidential um, and they are telephone based, so very easily accessible. Um, so if you would like to connect in with these services, you can get in touch with our Information and Support Centre to find out more. Um, the number is on the screen as well as our email address. Um, otherwise, you can easily find it on the Lung Foundation Australia website. Um, but we also do have a number of peer support group options as well available for lung cancer patients, um, as well as a care support group. Um, so please, again, ring our Information and Support Centre to find out more around how to connect in with those. Um, and the lovely Danielle is actually, in fact, a group leader for one of those online vibrant communities. Um, so, yeah, if you would like to um, find out more information or read up on any um, of our lung cancer resources as well, they're all available on lungfoundation.com.au. Um, but that does bring us to the conclusion of today's webinar. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And we hope you found this webinar helpful in answering some of your key questions around lung cancer. Um, but thank you again to our lovely panellists for sharing everything with us today. Um, and we hope that you have a lovely afternoon and take care of yourselves and each other. Bye for now. <laughs>